welcome all of you uh, joining this meeting, this interview and discussion, which uh, I'm, I'm very honored to do this with a good friend of mine, uh, Glenn Littolo uh, from Perth, Australia. And uh, it's really a, a pleasure because he's part of uh, what I call uh, the winning team we have uh, in the Master Clinicians pro Program in, uh, in Australia. And we all became very good friends, uh, very skillful clinicians. Uh, and that the fact that we are working together for such a long period now uh, really uh, makes uh, things um, easier for us to discuss. And I have also a strong feeling that we evolve together in, the, in, the, in our uh, learning workflow. So especially Glenn uh, was playing a very important role when we uh, built into the program uh, a section of fully dangerous patients. And Glenn, you really introduced the form, as I see it, the, the word downhill dentition, the, term, the terminal dentition, which is um, uh, the topic of today. And we put that uh, special group of patients, younger patients, most of the time into the the, the, the group of the fully edentulous uh, patients, uh, which is basically the older Brennemark approach of uh, replacing a uh, uh, denture, moving around in the mouse uh, for uh, something which is fixed. And uh, if we go back, and I don't know, uh, um, can we share this? Green. Okay. Yeah, if we go to the title, the treatment options for the terminal dentition, uh, uh, we can discuss many things. We can go into the backward planning principle. So you start with a, a clear end result in mind and then you do your treatment plan after a proper diagnosis you we work in teams with technicians there's a lot of materials involved and to do a proper diagnosis we need an analysis and we can do in this group of patients an analysis on on different levels we can go from dental to functional phonetic and facial analysis just to mention a few of, of the possibilities. So it's quite complicated. And there's much more to, to tell about uh, this. But uh, what we did is uh, that if we go right to the uh, title of this uh, discussion, the terminal dentition, we can uh, analyze first at this starting point, what is really a terminal dentition? Glenn, when is a dentition from your point of view terminal? Can we extract these or what are the criteria you are applying for, for, for this, for approaching a patient uh, which we can put in, into this group? Well, I think it's, um, that's a really good question, Egon, and I think, um, it's, it's sometimes difficult to decide what is actually a terminal dentition and what is in fact a, um, a restorable dentition and what teeth we should, we should keep. And obviously we can talk about, you know, the caries or the, the breakdown of teeth or periodontal disease or congenitally missing teeth. And, and we can also talk about what the, 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 the possible sort of, um, options that we have for replacing, you know, whether we need to remove all of the teeth or whether we can keep some. And um, I think I tend to like to keep some teeth, obviously, with respect to the teeth themselves, if they're, if they're sound, if they've got a good five-year prognosis is basically how I look at everything. Um, there seems to be a lot of, um, there's a few people that can't hear anything. 
Um, I don't think I'm muted. Paul, you got. Um, but uh, thank the, you for letting me know. I'll I'll check with them right now. Okay. Um, I think we that we need to sort of. You know, you can you can have a pendulum swimming swinging one way, and where where you know like uh, everybody gets a. Uh, you know, all their teeth removed and put implants in, and obviously we can't have that. And and by the other um, side of the coin, we can maybe hang on to teeth that have got two millimeters of attachment and are flowing in the breeze, and and that's also too far. So um, I think we need to fit a happy medium there that the teeth definitely need to be removed, um, but by the same token, also that we can we keep them as much as possible. And sometimes that may have an economic sort of rationalism there too. You know, the classic case would be maybe the six anterior teeth or five anterior teeth in the mandible, which are, are reasonable, but there's got a resorbed posterior region where to to put implants in the posterior region requires, you know, a lot of vertical bone augmentation and with a higher risk. And um, then the teeth in the front may not be that great. And so a much simpler type of um, approach is to remove those teeth and then place implants into foraminally, and then you have a very predictable uh, way of doing things. So I think the terminal dentition needs to be decided from each individual case. Having okay, said that- Are there, sorry, uh, Glenn, are there sometimes implants already placed you decide to remove? So are, can failing implants be part of a terminal dentition in, uh, in our yeah. cookbook? Certainly, and I think it's it's happening more and more often. And I think that um, you know, uh, implants get placed by a lot of different people, and uh, some are placed well, and some places are, are, are placed appallingly. Um, at least we know we've got tools now that we can remove an implant and not really cause any damage to the bone, and put an implant in the correct position or a better position or a position that is more in keeping with the other implants that are placed. So yes, absolutely, implants, you can, you can consider them as failing, failing dentition, as terminal dentition as well. Okay, then uh, I, I would like to go to the, the next question. Um, if we can put this on screen. Here we are. Um, what is your usual treatment protocol if you approach a patient and it's now clear after the answer of on the first question that all these cases uh, can be quite complicated it's not um, always a, a very quick and fast decision making and a straightforward protocol i can imagine where do we tell the participants to start what what is your uh, toolbox uh, providing uh, if you approach a patient like this do you do an interview first how do you collect your data and how do you go on from there yeah i think that's um that's also interesting in that what i tend to do is that um i will sit down and have a chat to the patient for quite a while before even looking in their mouth and just ask them what is it that they want what is it that so expectations yeah. yeah what's their expectation you know do they want to have um absolute per perfection or a hyper normal result at the end of it or something that's natural as there are they looking at an aesthetic sort of change or are they looking at more function um what are their problems that they have you know uh are they having trouble eating or they're not having trouble eating do they just do, so function yeah yeah is the idea that they they want something that they can uh, you know are they are averse to having a denture for instance if they only want something that's fixed or do they want something that you know they that they can take out and clean how old are they what are their medical conditions there's a lot of things that you know you take into account so i don't have like a recipe that i follow for every patient so and, and then, then uh, also sorry if you're doing these interviews are you already thinking in the back of your head about materials uh, going to acrylic rather than to uh, ceramic artwork or on young patients there's a tendency to to 
to push one solution more than the other because a patient does not know everything. So you, you have to guide them through, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Decisions. absolutely. Yeah, I think that um, each patient is in an individual and, um, and depending on the answers that I get to those questions. So say if I've got a older individual that, um, you know, has had a denture or a partial denture and um, is happy enough with having, say, a maxillary denture, um, but they've never been able to, um, to cope with that partial denture that they had in the lower jaw, then I'll, I'll definitely move them to like a fixed solution in the, um, in the mandible. Really? but maybe have uh, an acrylic denture in the, in the top jaw. So, and also a lot of it depends on their sort of, um, you know, finances and what they're hoping to achieve. Obviously a younger type of individual that's going from most of the dentition is there, may not be functioning particularly well, but it's still a dentition. Um, and that has to be removed for whatever reasons it happens to be then they're definitely going to be looking at more fixed versus fixed type of um, solution. And then, um, so then we, we have a look at what's required for that particular person. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you seem to be very flexible in, in, in finding these solutions. Do you have a case of a younger patient in which you saw, for instance, between the two central incisors, still a beautiful papilla, and then you decided not to remove everything, but maybe keep a limited number of teeth for, mm. for aesthetic reasons and make two posterior bridges instead of taking out everything and going for the full arch on implants only, or the, these hybrid solutions, can that happen as well? Absolutely. I think that that is something that, um we certainly need to look at, you know, and a lot of cases are like that. The central incisors are, you know, maybe they, they create the cornerstone of the aesthetics for the patient. And so if we can, and the soft tissue, as you know, getting soft tissue really good in, uh, you know, full arch of implants either usually means that it's prosthetic soft tissues or, um, or you've managed to do, you know, you've got a few cases that, we reserve for our lectures where we've managed to, you know, get a beautiful sort of soft tissue result and, uh, and, the, and the, a lot of implants and, and a lot of tissue work and a lot of tissue grafting. Um, and but you can get there in the end, but it's, uh, it's a lot more difficult to do that way. So well, that, that's uh, what we call herodontics. And we, we, if we can bypass that, that uh, that's making life easier. So you sometimes keep something which is still uh, looking quite uh, acceptable mm. yeah. yeah okay then, um, we go to our next uh, question um, can you put that question on screen okay do you place and load immediately and how um, how do you make these decisions so you're gonna extract and that's in the planning but are you going to place your implants in the same session or do you need sometimes an intermediate period in which, uh, you know, you wait for osteointegration or a higher stability of the implants or just uh, go and splint everything and uh, send the patient home with something fixed, which can be a provisional, for instance? Well, how, how do you make these decisions? Okay. Well, we've been... Um immediately loading implants since about 94 um, in fixed arch situations, particularly in the mandible. So with, with a mandibular fixed bridge, we almost always um, immediately place and load. Um, so what I mean by loading is usually it's the next day just so that we can have um, our prosthesis made, a good quality prosthesis made overnight by the lab. So we would do that pretty much routinely. There is the odd case where you have the, uh, what the Americans like to call the M&M bone, where you've got just a very th a thin, hard cortex and then just chocolate in the middle. So those implants we can't get good stability with. Um, and so occasionally that means that we have to load them um, later. 
The maxilla is a different story and um, it's a lot of the time you can place implants and load them immediately. Um, I'm not sure what the percentages is, it's probably two thirds or so, maybe three quarters. Um, and then, but other times the patient just doesn't have enough bone to anchor the implant adequately. So in those cases, and then also it comes back a little bit to um, when I see somebody for uh, a terminal dentition and patients come for implants, we usually go through a, a maxillary denture first and see how they go with that. And then after we've got some healing, usually three months or so, they've had a bit of time to adjust to that upper denture and then we've got better bone to place the implants in um, and it's 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 a lot easier and you're working you've already worked out what the aesthetics are going to be like if you've, you've tried that out um, and so you're in a better place to start doing um, maxillary implants i know that that's different to some people some people do it the other way around but um, probably I would say maybe two thirds of patients that come in that want to have implants, so to speak, um, are quite happy with an upper denture and uh, a lower fixed bridge. So, yeah. yeah. And then it's funny, you're, you're, you were talking about the difference in approach between upper and lower. And you like to start, I think, with the positioning the mm. two upper central incisors in the best possible position and you like the, the denture as a tool for that. Mm -hmm. And then you adapt uh, the situation in the lower. In the lower jaw, you are probably removing for similar reasons also much more bone than you do in the upper jaw. Yeah. So that is also built in the the surgical protocol and and the decision making how to develop uh, your your pink prosthetic design probably mm -hmm. yeah yeah I think that um, one thing about um, a fixed prosthesis in the lower jaw whether it's on how many implants you want to put it on um, is that the mandible in particular has very thin uh, dimension at the incisor region. And, um, and so that bundle bone, we know from millions of studies is that that will resorb. And so it's better to remove that bone in the first place rather than doing a whole heap of grafting and things to try and maintain the bone thickness. Remove that bone and then you can get a much better prosthesis. It's much thicker as for a much better height, I mean, so it's stronger. You can then develop a better emergence profile so that it's easier to clean. You're not looking at something that's thick or ridge lapped or something like that. And um, it, it provides a much easier, better way to you know, provide a prosthesis for people if you're doing that. The maxilla, you can do different ways. I, you know, that's, yeah. that's fine. But I think the mandible, probably the problems that I see now um, with um, you know, the patients that have been referred in after having, say, all on fours or something like that, is that the, there's been insufficient reduction of, of that bundle bone. And so then they get resorbed and they get peri-implantitis, they get problems, they can't clean it because the prosthesis is so small and uh, or it's ridge lapped or something like that, or the prosthesis fractures and then it puts undue loading on the other implants. And that's, that's where the problem lies, really. Yeah, and, and on top of that, I think you, you need uh, also prosthetic space. So yes. yep. the, the typical amount of millimeters for uh, a fixed lower implant supported restoration, how, how, uh, how much would that be? So you have let me, an incisor of 10 millimeter, but under that incisor, there must be space for the 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 structure the 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 framework and the, the pink part as well so in, in total from the tip of the incisor to the bone how much would you like to have when you start removing bone because very often that ridge uh, can be also extruded uh, uh, well, I think um, it comes down a little bit. I think the minimum is really sort of sort of around about 16 to 18 millimeters. Mm -hmm. um, and the more, the better, you know, being a prosthodontist, you know, like I like more space because I can have a thinner uh, labiolingual dimension of the bridge. 
And um, if I've got uh, a, a taller type of uh, prosthesis, I can then develop the occlusion much better. I can allow to change from you know, more of a class two to a class one or vice versa. And it's, it's um, you end up- More with flexible. Yeah. yeah, you've got a lot more flexibility there. Plus you've got the strength, you know, so both at the provisional stage and also at the definitive type of prosthesis. So um, the more space, the better, you know, like I think I saw something that Americans love their slogans. They like say the space makes the case, you know, so we don't call our patients cases, but you know, I get what they're talking about. Yeah. So you're not afraid to remove that bone in that case then. No. And I also think it's much better to have a smooth line rather than having yes. uh, a and skeletal bony profile. And realistically, that bone is going to resorb anyway. So oh. I can understand people's reticence about uh, removing bone. Um, they think, you know, obviously I want as much bone as possible. But in this type of situation, removal of the bone makes a much more robust type of um, peri-implant bone and uh, more robust um, soft tissue and uh, the whole thing. So, yeah. Quite different from our approach in, in the upper joy. If we want to work uh, with something fixed with implants and preserve the tissues of the patient. So that's a, a very good point. That brings me to the other uh, question, uh, Glenn. Do you keep these for staged uh, provisionalization? I think you already answered that question. Uh, I think uh, we do keep teeth, like say for instance, we might keep some t like the canines and the molars and then create a fixed provisional bridge over the top of the implants while we're waiting for you know, sinus grafting or GBR or whatever it happened to be. So or in the uh, upper. Uh, in the upper uh, jaw, yeah. Not so much in the lower jaw, but in the upper jaw, definitely we do that. Um, because and often the bone is insufficient to load immediately. So I think then you can go with a, uh, a longer term provisional. Um, and you can always make some teeth last for, you know, the four, four to six months or something like that. Yeah, you probably only need sort of, uh, I would say, three teeth to have a, a sort of yeah. a tripod uh, support. Mm. And, uh, but that yeah, makes that... jump uh, also to the lower jaw in which you, um, you can sometimes even decide to make a very simple solution, not a denture, but an, an overdenture on very few implants. Even one implant can give some amazing results as I, uh, I learned from you. Can you share some of this experience with the, with, with the audience? Because you have been doing this now for a very long period. Yes. Well, that's a good, oops. Oh no, you, you've got to stop sharing or something apparently, Egon. Um, yeah. But with the, yes, oh, what- oh, Can you switch the sharing or I, I can do this? Okay. Stop. Advice start. Uh, here we go. You you want to show us some uh, some of the data of the the single implant retained over the yeah. So we um, about seventeen years ago, Patrick Henry and I um, thought that we you know we could place a single implant in the midline of the mandible for existing denture wearers so this is not terminal dentition this is existing denture wearers and so now That's we've got uh, yeah so now we've got a 15 year follow up of this prospective study which has been uh, remarkably successful and so we've actually had uh, there was around about 40 patients that we saw and there's around 25 that are remaining because uh, it was an elderly population and unfortunately they leave us for greater greener pastures but um, we've had no failures of the implants and very high satisfaction with that and very low maintenance um, so it was a, a large ball attachment which is uh, more difficult to get these days because it was discontinued um, but you can have it uh, made up by um, yeah well I'll actually I'll put a I'll put a plug out there, Chris Hart. <laughs> yeah. 
So it's been very good and very little problems with um, uh, the, the actual ball attachments and um, very high success rates with, you know, it's a very simple procedure. So um, yeah, watch out for the, uh, the publication when it comes out, I think probably early next year or something like that. Okay, well, uh, thank you for, for giving us this, uh, you know, uh, uh, this information because if if I really uh, follow my gut feeling, if I see one implant in the middle, I think of breaking dentures because mm -hmm. it's like a, a fulcrum wobbling movements. Mm -hmm. uh, but this this apparently did not happen, and you you put some metal in the dentures. Uh, we didn't. Uh, um, or, we didn't or just acrylic because just I. Acrylic expected yeah. break we we had some initial breakages when we just connected the the attachment with cold cure acrylic um, and then when we did we changed it to like a, a a process lab reline procedure and then that we didn't have any more fractures we occasionally we get a fractured denture but you get fractured dentures anyway so um, but it was very small like uh, i think there were maybe two fractured dentures so it's the, I mean, the key with it is that it is retention of the denture. It's not supporting that denture. So the denture itself has to fit well and have good stability on its own, but the implant attachment really just helps retain that um, denture onto the tissues and stop it from moving around, you know, up and down and anteroposteriorly and things. So it's still got to be a decent denture, but um, it, yeah, it's a, it's a simple way of improving things. Now, yeah. I don't recommend that for your terminal dentition patient at all. Like I wouldn't recommend any over dentures for terminal dentition, but um, it's very good for those long-term denture wearers that are now starting to have some problems with um, adapting to, you know, keeping their adaptation to their denture. Yeah, and how often uh, do you recommend to rebase these dentures if you have that single implant in the middle? That was between usually about three to five years or so. So if you look at denture uh, literature, they recommend relining or rebasing every three to five years. And ours is basically the same. So um, we've had some that have lasted a lot longer than that and some that are sort of, you know, around that three to five year mark. So it's okay. Then that brings me to the next question. If I can get that. Um, here we go. Yeah. How do you design? Because we talked about provisionals and then I, I probably go back to the, the, the fixed solutions. How do you design and make the provisionals and what are the main functions for you of a provisional? Just to give something a patient has, uh, has in the mouth to, to send them uh, out with, with teeth or what, what are uh, other goals uh, you have in mind when you place a provisional? Do you use it to do a test drive, like an aesthetic or a phonetic test drive, or uh, mm. how do you how do you work with these provisionals? Yeah, I think um, that's a a big question, Egon. Um, but uh, my, you know, like we do the usual sort of workups, you know, smile designs and uh, you know what the patient wants, all that sort of thing first up so that we know what sort of teeth, where they want them, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, say for a simple um, immediate denture, immediate maxillary denture and um, four implant retained fixed bridge in the, in the mandible, um, we will make up, um, we generally make up, you know, an immediate denture in the normal way and then we'll fit the lower bridge to that immediate denture so we've got the occlusal plane, sizal planes, all that sort of stuff, all correct. And we've been, we've gone through quite a long, you know, trial and error of various types of provisionals in that we've had all acrylic provisionals and then we've had metal reinforced provisionals and um, laser welded rod, titanium rods and titanium cylinders. 
Uh, we've just sort of started trying a few um, CAD CAM milled frameworks that we can do overnight as well. Um, and the idea is that we make a fairly strong provisional because there's nothing worse than putting in some all acrylic bridge and then the patient fractures off the cantilever or fractures off the tooth and then they spend a lot of money and they say, oh, you just use some cheap teeth. So we didn't like that too much. So that's why we now make a... Reinforcements. Yeah, with a large reinforcement. With a, it's a wraparound type of um, uh, framework. And then we don't have the problems with fractured cantilevers or fractured teeth because you've got a rigid framework. That would also be better for osseo integration too, because you're keeping the everything splintered yeah. together. Yeah. So I think that that's important. It's important from my perspective. These bridges will obviously last a lot longer. So some of these bridges I've got had for maybe 15 years that they've been in the mouth. So that their provisional has lasted. Long term provisional. <laughs> so it's a long term provisional. Um, that keeps the expectation down too, because we just say it's just a temporary. You know that. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, then we can repair them easily and we can reline them. So it depends. So that's at the sort of the lower end cost of things. Um, when it goes to maxillary bridges, then you've got more things that you have to worry about. And that, as you said, phonetics come into play. Um, the aesthetics is a bit more, you know, significant in that. And so um, we may well do, you know, like some try-ins and, and, um, and we go to a bit more trouble with all of that. Obviously, the, um, the placement of the implants is more critical because that's things like phonetics are heavily dependent on having a thin prosthesis. Um, and so, uh, you know, everything has to be sort of done um, a little bit more accurately. Uh, not that we don't do accurately in the mandible, but um, I think it's a bit more critical because you've got less space to develop what you want. You can't remove as much bone as you can in the mandible to have your running room or prosthetic space as much in the ma in the maxilla, particularly if you're looking at sort of doing things uh, with minimal prosthetic uh, gingiva. So I think that's where it becomes a little bit more difficult to... Yeah. to How yeah. do you position that transition line between the pink prosthetical part part and the, and the real tissues of the patients? Because if that becomes visible, uh, when the patient really smiles uh, very openly, that, that can be uh, already right. uh, a very late discovery when the implants are already placed. So, yeah. you know, and that it's is, not nice to that, discover that that line should have been three millimeters higher, but the implants are, are there. Yeah. So and you, you that's test drive this before. Yeah, like we look at that. And it's not just hiding this transition line too is that uh, and we've done some sort of uh, 3d uh, photogrammatic sort of um, uh, what's it called um, anthropometric measures on on looking at this because it's not just a matter of just hiding the the, the, the line. particularly if they've come from a denture where they've had like these mega flanges or something like that so you actually have to like look at what where your emergence is coming from that implant. So it may be that the transition line needs to be substantially above the lip line um, to give you that lip support that you need um, to replace the flange. So if you just have it just above the, the smile line, wherever that happens to be, and uh, you know, it changes a lot with patients. Um, so you, but you actually have to look at what sort of facial support you're getting as well. So we will test, we often will test drive that with a denture that has been trimmed to, to sort of um, mimic what, the, what, what a bridge would be able to do based on the amount of bone that they've got. So um, you might look at a CAT scan and say, oh, you've got 10 millimetres of bone, terrific. But if they show 10 millimetres of, um, you know, uh, gingival tissues, then you've removed all the bone to even just get your transition line above the lip line. So it's, uh, you, you need to look at that very carefully. Otherwise, you can end up with a disaster, as, as we've all seen. So, yeah. so again, much more complicated in the upper than it is in the lower, especially if we throw in also the poor bone quality we have there. So there is, uh, 
uh, room for mistakes. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, Paul, the, the next question I would like to put on the screen. Here we go. Let's see if, it, if we can click through it. Yeah, that is a, a classical one. What is the ideal number of implants? We can divide that in upper and lower. We already talked about an overdenture on one single implant. But if a patient has no res restrictions, what would be your ideal proposal for upper and lower? Patient has terminal dentition. You have the license to take these teeth uh, out, which are hopeless. How, how would your ideal number of implants uh, uh, be, be divided between the upper and the lower jaw? So did you say that I had unrestriction, unrestricted amount of implants from the patient's perspective? Was it like a financial Financially, thing? no, no financially limitations uh, on uh, with which brings well, you. I think that if you've got no financial lim limitations, then I'd probably go for about 20 implants in the upper and 20 in the lower, because um, <laughs> that, would, that would fund my non-existent trip to Italy, wouldn't it, next time? No, yeah. I, 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 I certainly see that. Right, no, right. uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, with a, uh, the ideal number of implants, I think is, um, is a very interesting question. And, and I think that again, it is a bit dependent on the patient in the lower jaw. Um, then, you know, we've been doing, uh, four implants, um, as an immediate loading and all that sort of thing for, for a long time now, for a couple of decades. So. Um, I'm very happy with with four implants in the mandible. Um, in the in the maxilla, it's a different story, and maybe we can come back to that. Um, I did want to share uh, maybe the next uh, slide here, where um, um, which is on uh, trefoil, where. We, for the last uh, five, six years, I've been involved in some of the research behind this with uh, Kenji Higuchi, who is the uh, guy who really developed this whole trefoil um, uh, concept, which is, a, um, which is a sort of an extrapolation of what Bronnemark did with the Bronnemark Novum. And so uh, it involves having three implants in the mandible that are in three pre-programmed positions and then a pre-made bar that is able to allow some movement within the, um, uh, show you that first one because it's got an exploded view of all the little washers and things like that, that allow you to get a passively fitting um, bar on those three repositioned implants, three pre-programmed positions, which fits into roughly um, about 85% of patients will be able to have this three implant type of bridge. And so the idea here is that because it's all pre-manufactured, um, you can keep the cost down. Um, the surgery itself is sort of uh, semi-guided um, and it's, um, you're able to sort of have this type of um, uh, um, off the shelf type of um, fixed prosthesis as opposed to a fully customized bespoke type of um, approach. So that's been quite interesting. And uh, we have sort of four year results on these patients of which we haven't had a failure of implants at all. And the prosthesis, because it's quite a rigid, strong looking bar there, uh, we've had no prosthetic problems either. So it enables them to have like a definitive bridge on the day of or the next day of surgery. And so um, that also expedites a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the appointments that are needed. And um, so- uh, and You remove quite a again a lot of bone I see, uh, Glenn, because the building height is quite, uh, I see yeah, four, one all, 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 only for the, the hardware and then the teeth come on top of that. So you, you have to remove um, quite a lot of bone. 
yeah, the minimum vertical height there you need is around 22 millimeters, which yeah. um, is a little more, maybe a couple of millimeters more than what would be ideal for say all on four. Um, and I think that's something that people sort of see how much bone is removed and think that that's a lot of bone, but realistically, you know, if you're doing all on four, for instance, then you want to be removing some bone anyway. So um, it's, it's, it is a little bit more bone, um, that's for sure, um, but not sort of overly significant. Um, and so, yeah, the idea is that, again, it's something that you can, uh, you can provide for your patients, a cheaper type of option. And, and I think that it's not so much the, uh, you know, cannibalizing the all on four type of patients, it's more sort of maybe upselling or up, upgrading, um, say a two implant overdenture type of patient. So if they're looking at an overdenture, then this is a far better um, type of prosthesis yeah. than compared With to an only one more implant yeah so that yeah 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 and so yeah our bone levels and all that sort of stuff around them has been terrific we have been involved in a, a multi-center study which they have two-year results on that with um it's um uh, almost 99 percent success rate of the implants and 100 percent success i think 99 percent for the prosthesis as well so um so done around the rest of the world um very high success rate as well, which is quite good. Yeah, it can be scary for, for some people that one size fits all. Mm. Uh, have you had problems with that prefabricated arch uh, shape, which is placed uh, at the bottom of that X bridge? Or, or you said, well, 80, 80, 85% of the patients can, can go with this uh, or? Yeah, and I think the key now is that, you know, we have such great imaging with um, cone beam so and we have yeah. software programs that we can plug this, um, you know, this into to see whether we can do it beforehand. And so, yeah. um, and then, and, and really that's the key, you know, you, you work out whether or not you can do this for a patient before you even, you know, attempt anything. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Final question about this type of uh, solution. As as you're cutting uh, down the crestal bone, you you um, you end up in the basal bone. It's it's called basal bone because there's also muscle attachment there, and that's why that bone will be maintained over time much more than the 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 alveolar part of the the ridge. Um, did you have problems sometimes that the keratinized tissue you need, we need so badly around our implants emerging is sort of in competition with the muscle insertion in that very low uh, portion of the mandible? Um, no, not in this sort of area, but um, occasionally you do, you are placing implants very you know, yeah. below the medial tubercles and so where the muscle attachment is and so you know you need to kind of dissect some of that muscle and remove some of that bone to lower the level of where the attachment is so um which is obviously something that's not you know not everybody wants to do that sort of thing so um but uh, most of the time no it hasn't been um hasn't been an issue for that because you're not removing bone down that low most of the time. That's in an already severely resorbed mandible that that becomes an issue. Good. Okay, then uh, we can go to the next question, um, which is... Over here, that's... We have a few more questions. What are the common pitfalls and problems? Um, and do you have something against, you know, the commercially driven all on four clinics? They, they sort of have that uh, solution in mind. They make a lot of publicity uh, with, with all on four, for instance. And if you walk through the door, it's pretty sure they will deliver the all on four. Um, do you think that sometimes uh, colleagues, they go too fast and they 
don't dedicate enough time for the diagnostics or they adapt the patient to a protocol and not the other way around? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think having already just discussed a protocol <laughs> with the yeah. trifle, um, it's a bit hard for me to say uh, you shouldn't. But I think um, I but think. But you pull that out when, when you see the indication, right? So it, it's yeah, not yeah, a must thing. I think that um, I think that we have options, and the, and the options are, you know range a lot, and that we need to you know, pick the best option for that particular patient, not sort of put everyone into sort of a, a, a recipe that um, the protocol must be followed. And I think, you know, that's, that should be for any patient and for anything that we do in dentistry. With, um, uh, with respect to sort of um, some of the marketing associated with all yeah. four and that type of thing, I, uh, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think we need to have, um, we, we need to have an individualized approach for all of our patients. Um, I think that on the plus side, though, um, certainly um, the marketing is, has created a greater awareness of, um, of implants that, that, with their ability to do what they do. And so that's gone out to them, to the public. And, and so I think that that's a, that's a good thing. And then you can discuss what that patient may need in light of what they may have read or seen or looked on the, you know, Dr. Google and all that sort of stuff. So from that perspective, we've got more educated patients. And I think that that's a good thing. Um, certainly my view on the, the mandible is that I don't think that you need any more than four implants. I think that that's sort of a fairly, standard thing for me and it's worked very well for you know 20 years or so yeah. in the maxilla i think that if we look at the literature there's been some quite good systematic reviews and some reviews of all on four and some of the issues that can happen over a long period of time and most of those um, problems that they see are related to excess loading so most of the problems where they have with um, failures of implants um, and is due to say bruxism to do with males um, to do with opposing a uh, either some sort of fixed solution as whether it's implants or teeth um, and poor bone quality or inexperienced surgeons you know that sort of stuff is really related to excessive loading and and I think that some in, in some individuals that four implants in the maxilla is not enough. And um, mm -hmm. you may get a sort of a, an overloading sort of situation. And um, so I think that we need to probably be cognizant of all of the issues there and what sort of patient we're dealing with. So more implants in the upper, um, longer implants if possible probably but also wider implants that's my question mark yeah i think so i think that the angled implants um you know anterior to the sinus where you're going from say the molar region into you know you're angling it anteriorly to get into like the canine fossa region well that's good because you get into better quality bone instead of say relying on you know grafting or something which is going to extend the possibilities likewise um, going the other way and maybe going backwards into the zygoma or pterygoid is another option that you can that you can you know utilize to still provide an immediately loaded bridge um, and quite quick treatment um, you know thing uh, treatment sort of time frame um, compared to say you know bilateral sinus grafting or something like that i think that's got value as well so um, but then the maxilla is just a is a more more difficult type of a, um, a treatment proposition and i think we need to be a little bit more individualistic about how we approach that yeah and about the white implants to look for cortical anchorage on, on maybe both sides. Can that be a pitfall? Um, like jeopardizing blood supply around the implant? Uh, is your trend to go smaller? Yeah, in general, it is to go smaller. Yeah, and I think you have better, better bone, thicker bone, more bone around the implant, the better, more soft tissue around the implant uh, is also better too. More and so I think, um, biology. Yeah, and then bio, boosting the biotype to quote, um, who was that? 
Oh, it was you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that that's important. You know, I think that's really important. And I think that, you know, you've been saying this for decades now, about boosting the biotype. And I think now we are really aware that having thicker soft tissue around implants is a, is a, is a huge issue and that we need to try and get that as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, that's also uh, bringing me to the the next question, um, which is that we can have problems when well, the the final bridge is at a certain point delivered, uh, and. I don't know if we have the time to go into detail uh, of how that uh, is made. I think there, uh, there's always a, a rigid connection between the implants and then we have the material choice of the pink and the, the white part. Uh, um, do you want to say quickly something about this or do we go directly to the next one, which is the maintenance in time of, of something that has cost a lot of work and money for the patient. And mm -hmm. we want these uh, constructions also to last. Mm -hmm. I think I could maybe answer both of them at the same time. Yeah. In that, um, I try and have, if I've got a two jaw case, I try to have ceramic in the maxilla and acrylic um, teeth in the mandible. We have ceramic versus ceramic, then we have a Greek wedding and we have lots of smashing ceramic everywhere. I think that if we have acrylic in the lower jaw, we're keeping the, uh, the upper jaw intact and, um, and then we might sacrifice a little bit of wear. So we call that, we do a retread every sort of, um, every maybe five to 10 years, depending on their, their, their power function, their use of all of that sort of thing. I think that um, the other, so that's my f basic philosophy on that. Uh, we can go and talk into materials if we've got some time, but from a maintenance point of view, I think maintenance is critical and um, we go to a lot of trouble to make sure that our, the bridges are, are cleansable, very easily cleansable. We go through various different sort of protocols with our patients. You know, things like water picks or uh, oxy jets, those sorts of things, um, uh, picksters, various things so that we can make sure that the, everything is clean. And we see them a lot to start off with anyway. And then we might continue to see them a lot if they're not very good at it. Remember they're on their third dentition. So um, we, we're very big on sort of the plaque control aspect of maintenance. Uh, we also sort of check on screws and things like that from time to time based on their history. So whether we see that and based on, you know, what type of prosthesis they've got and all that sort of thing too. Do you sometimes remove the fixed uh, bridges for maintenance purpose or cleaning? We don't, we don't really need to remove them for cleaning because they're, they're cleansable. And so I think that that's, um, you can see that pretty easily. We do remove them every now and again um, and check on screws, particularly when there's things like angulated abutments, which are a bit more prone to, to come loose. And so we might do that um, every couple of years just to check on them. Um, it depends. If they've, had, if they've had them removed, you know, every couple of years for a few times and there's been no screws loose, well, then we might leave it a bit longer than for the next one. So it, it just depends a bit, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we're talking now uh, more or less about the, the visible part ab above mm -hmm. the gums in the oral cavity, but what do you do or what can we do in general to, to keep crestal bone levels stable? Because that's where, where, the, where the trouble can start. If, uh, if an implant, uh, yeah, the number is already uh, as, as less as possible. Uh, because that was a little bit the, the trend. Don't place too many implants mm -hmm. um, if, if it's not commercially driven. But then, you know, if you place few implants, you want to keep them. And it all starts with stable crystal bone levels. So what would be your recipe to keep crystal bone stable? 
Well, I think that um, we've touched on it a little bit already. I think um, thickness of tissue around the um, implant, um, having the implant within a bony housing, of whatever sort that happens to be, but having enough bone around there. I think the design of the implant, it's fairly, um, it's been, you know, the literature is pretty strong on the fact that uh, uh, platform shifting um, improves the, the bone levels around those implants. The connection, uh, what, what's your connect favorite connection or neck uh, of the implant for? Yeah, the conical connection, I think is, um, is my favorite at the moment. Um, um, it has been for quite a long time now. So I think that um, I would prefer to have a conical connection. I think it provides a better, more, better seal and also a better, uh, just a more solid connection. So something that's fairly conical. Um, and uh, and having that in, you know, obviously in a titanium interface as well, I think is also uh, a big yeah. deal. So um, other than that, um, you yeah. know, do you bring that about. conical connection away from the bone by using intermediate abutments like the multi-unit abutments, or would you, yeah. would you like to do your prosthetic work at tissue level? I I, I do. I, uh, I use multi-unit abutments or on ones or whatever it happens to be, but um, uh, to bring that tissue, because I don't want to disturb that peri-implant tissue as much as possible. So I do like, particularly for full arch types of cases, I use multi-unit abutments all the time. And that makes it a lot easier for things like try-ins and changing things and uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. The other thing it does do is it also, it brings the interface, you know, closer to the tissue surface and also gives you a kind of like an implant stack so that if there's an over, uh, if there's an overload of the prosthesis, for instance, then you have a small screw that breaks and that's easy to retrieve and replace rather than having a lot more force going down onto the implant, you know. So I think people kind of forget about that aspect of it. So biomechanically, yeah. it's better to be at multi-unit level rather than being at implant level. Breaking an implant. And if you do um, work for referring dentist, uh, I think you would prefer to, to, to give them a starting point with the multi-unit abutments already on top of the implants and they can start from a, a safer yeah. uh, level, I, I think. Yeah. Well, that, uh, that's interesting. We managed to talk about so many different uh, things in, uh, in, in one hour. Is there any last question we could uh, ask, uh, Glenn? I think, I think maybe the only other thing that I, I you know, like is uh, I saw a lecture by, you know, that one of the things you talk about in guide is, um, you know, really changing the jaw relationship of patients, you know, that might have a big class two or a class three. How do you sort of, what do you think about that in, in comparison, say, doing orthognathic surgery? Yeah, I think, well, the, the trend of our discussion now was that we, we rather like to do a lot of work up front. And the surgical part is actually the most, um, the, the easiest work. Mm -hmm. The diagnostic part and the test drive you can do before you start it's really uh, a paramount importance. So we like, if we talk about terminal dentitions, we like to improve the end result as compared to our starting point. And then what I found is that we, if we have a, we have a, a, a difference uh, in the jaw relationship, so we, we, we can actually not change the position of the bone too much, but we can change quite a lot the tooth positions with an implant supported restoration. And I think uh, if we talk about class two or three, it's all in that anterior mismatch where we can do very good work. So it's easy, uh, if you work with implants, to place a canine a little bit more forward or backward and work with, um, you know, the, the ideal class one occlusal scheme. If we, if we look only at the teeth, by 
inclining implants by putting them deep in the basal bone by using small diameter implants, play with the angulation, and then it's easy to go from a class two into a class one and a class three into a class one. It's a bit more difficult because normally we build out the upper more then we go down, uh, we go back with the lower. Yeah, the, yeah. It's a very complex uh, thing, but as a rule of thumb, uh, if we give more space in the mouse, facial aesthetics improve, lip support improves, and you don't run into the danger, which is one of the pitfalls we can mention here together. If you make an arch smaller, let's say you're correcting a, a mandibular class three by uh, making the arch smaller in the lower jaw, you might invade the space of the tongue, which is very uncomfortable for the patient, and it will be a never uh, a comfortable thing to have um, an arch in, uh, in, uh, in the lower jaw, which is too tight for the tongue. Uh, mm. On the other hand, if you give more space, the tongue will adapt, and the phonetics yeah. uh, will pick up. And, but that's a very interesting group of patients and these end results are stable. You, you play a lot with the orbicularis oris, which is covering the, the arches and also the runway for a smile, if that's nicely parabolic and there's no anterior mismatch because we correct that, uh, that's, uh, that's such a big improvement. So that, yeah. that's probably one of my favorite group of patients. If you can improve that, you change their lives. Yeah, I think that's the, that's actually a really good point because you, and I think that you know we we get caught up in you know when we create a denture or something is that we put the the teeth on the ridge and so but you don't need to put the teeth on the ridge when you have implants. You can do anything you like. But uh, so sometimes the workup for these patients, you create a very strange you know, denture or that, that might be way outside laterally for the, for the maxilla. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, and it wouldn't work as a denture, but it works beautifully as a, as an implant reconstruction. So it's, uh, it's, again, I think the key with everything that we've said today is actually that, you know, the diagnostics and the workup is probably the most significant thing to work out how we're going to create facial support, create aesthetics, create function, uh, make sure that we're not, you know, putting implants into the wrong area. So, but we have more diagnostic ability than we've ever had before. You know, we've got the software planning for that marries up our prosthetic work up to the, you know, where the bone is. We can do different programs for smile designs. We can do, you know, digital photography, all of the things that we've got at our fingertips make life a lot easier than it was even you know 10 years ago yeah yeah so i think that's a very good point uh, uh, to stop today because we could go on for for forever i guess mm -hmm. and uh, for me i think it's also a real pleasure to to have this uh, interview and discussion with you i thank uh, guide for putting us together on on the web and uh, I'm looking forward to, to meet you soon in, in person as we can start traveling again. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. I can't <laughs> it's, uh, <and> maybe, <laughs> good. maybe get out of isolation. As we, as we used to do in the, in the old days. <laughs> yes. yes, well, we, we're now moved on to the same session again, Egon, so I'm very excited about that. <laughs> good. So Thank then, you. Uh, I I would uh, give the word to to guide uh, to to close uh, the session, and I I think uh, not 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 me. We thank all the participants for attending, and um, yeah, touch. no one said it better than you, Dr. Egon and Dr. Littleo. Thank you both for uh, doing this event tonight, and uh, thank you to all participants.